So uh, when I was uh, 21, I I bought this uh, cheap ticket in order to visit this uh, Katsura Palace in uh, Japan. Um, I think I made uh, the most uh, complicated step overs in order to come there because I was a student and had not uh, so much money. But um, when I was there, I was blown away by this uh, palace because I had a friend who explained me so many beautiful things about it. It is the beauty of its calmness, of the place whereby nature, architecture, the quality of the, maybe the rituals who were there, you felt in that place. So unbelievable, uplifting. But then 11 years later, when I, on that spot, when I was in the, in the Katsura, I decided then um, uh, to become an architect. Th then I became this architect. And I designed this bridge we all know here in the city of Rotterdam. Um, but, but the client here wanted to design me an iconographic project, a highly intensive new image for this uh, city. But that was quite difficult for me to do because I, I was working on so many aspects of the history of Rotterdam, the robustness of the harbor, all the qualities of uh, what the uh, north to the south of the city of Rotterdam could bring together all in this bridge. But I discovered that it was not the image or the iconographic quality I could give to this bridge, but that it was the people who took over the public quality of this bridge after so many years. So what I discovered that it was the human aspect of architecture what was so important, what changed the quality of this uh, uh, bridge. And this is maybe uh, m the best example of a sailor who told me the story that when he over the years passed by this bridge, he felt that he came home and, and that the bridge was a part of his life almost every day when he was uh, passing this bridge. So that's why he tattooed this uh, quite unusual uh, uh, image of the bridge on his uh, body. Um, but that brings me to the subject of where I'd like to talk about today. Like I explained, architecture is having an enormous effect on people. And it's so that maybe um, that if I talk about health, that I'm not then interested in the body of uh, health or the image of health, like I talked about the image also of uh, architecture, uh, what is not so important, but that, that images grow over time or icons grow. I'm interested, like this man standing in his place and, it, and in its space, it's an environment. So how can we deal with this environment? And maybe the square where he stands in is maybe the indoor environment and the circle is the world where we deal with where, of course, we have to uh, so sustainable about. But it is not this aspect of sustainability and health where I'm interested in, because sustainability in architecture, that's more discussion in my field, but it's all about ticking the boxes lately and uh, suggesting that if you have a green roof, then, then you have green architecture, but that's not the case. I'm on, uh, totally interested in the full essence of how sustainability started with with particularly human health. So how can we then, through architecture, benefit or health on multiple levels? How can we improve that? And I will explain it in, in this talk on three levels. The, the physical health, on the level of the physical health, social health, and the psychological health. So but let me start with a uh, project we did in Groningen. It's a project uh, we did for a um, government uh, client. You see here a section of, an, uh, of, of the floors. Um, but also you see the, the installation techniques. And, and what we did here was to change the air conditioning and the system of the way how that was introduced in this building. Because I was having such a bad experience with the way how air conditions were uh, used in our, our uh, uh, indoor spaces. And maybe we all agree here how bad our indoor spaces are. When we talk about our environment, for 80% we are indoors, and we forget how bad our air is indoors. And often bacteria move from one person to the other because we circulate this air in a totally wrong way. 
in, in these buildings. So here we introduced a technique what is coming out of the hospital technique, whereby air just simply moves out of the floor and goes vertically out in, uh, in the ceiling. It's a system that is simply used in operation rooms, whereby, of course, bacteria cannot move from one person to the other. So, so this technique gave the opportunity for this client and this building to reduce close to 20% of the building leaf, or this, sorry, the, the, the sickness leaf of this, uh, of this uh, project. So the sickness leaf was enormously reduced. But of course, with that design comes in, you have to uh, find a way to uh, bring in uh, this wind and, and this fresh air. And we did that in the middle of the building, where we introduced these vertical fins, whereby the wind can, in an intelligent way, by the, the, the movement of these fins, come into this building. And not only the wind was used for the clean and clear air, but also for uh, producing uh, energy in this uh, project. But in a similar way, I believe that it is so important to think about the way how we can activate the body in our buildings. And more than eight years ago, I started with this project. It's a uh, uh, research institute in uh, Germany. It's called the Fraunhof Institute. Uh, we introduced here uh, many staircases in the uh, center of the, the, the project. We hided the elevator, so you could not find any elevator in the building. And people would just use the stairs constantly to meet each other and to integrate a social, innovative uh, way of working whereby people would uh, uh, yeah, change more ideas and, and with this stimulation of ideas was far more stimulated than, uh, than before. But of course then you have to make an attractive atrium and you have to play with daylight and we use this colors on the staircase in order to indicate where you are in the building. And we introduce also here these social meeting places. And we know now also that uh, if we talk about social meeting places in our working environment, that that boosts enormously our health. Um, if you're just behind your computer the whole day and you're not socialized, I mean, it's actually really not good for you. And, and maybe we also know that today standing in the work environment is also good. So, all these things need to be, of course, supported by architecture. So this is the aspect of social health, where I believe we can so much do within our profession. Like in this university campus, um, we went against the traditional means of compartmentalizing buildings with the own faculty in one building. Uh, it's the University for Engineering and Design in Singapore, whereby in each building, the engineering department, the design department, and also the way how uh, the product department could meet each other all on one floor. So professors, visitors, the tutors, students, they would all constantly meet on this one floor and have the opportunity to, to socialize with each other and then give the opportunity through a system like this to use socializing as a way of learning. And as you know, students now today organize the professors. I mean, they sometimes invent topics and want to gather in the way how they can uh, do their uh, thesis, for instance. But the spaces around this uh, university are green, open, transparent. Um, the void spaces are made highly attractive so that you, of course, walk again. And uh, color is used to find your way again through the building. But the last topic, and maybe for me one of the most important and maybe more difficult to define, is uh, the way how we can benefit from more psychological aspects of health in architecture. And it's particularly there important where we feel sometimes compartmentalized in buildings, because we have to deal with fire compartmentalization. Like in this building, it's a uh, car museum in Stuttgart also. Um, we didn't want that. We didn't want the public would move from one compartment to the next, and that you would have many dead ends in the building. We introduced this smoke detector system, so when there is a fire, that um, within five minutes, the smoke would be sucked out of this building in a tornado through the whole building. And by this, we could make an open, highly transparent, and very safe 
uh, environment for the public walking around in this building. So, and we know that safety is the highest stress level for many people in buildings. And, and by this, people know where the staircases are, when there is a fire. They can see each other. They know how to move around the building. And it created this, in this transparency, an enormous amount of communication what we could introduce in this museum. So here there are Isle of Ventures, there, there are three, you can see them. Uh, there are more, but I'm not going to tell you where they are. Um, <laughs> But, but when you go up and take this one-way elevator, so it's only a one-way elevator up, then you have to do the job yourself. You have to walk down. And there are two pathways, so it's almost like if you walk in a time machine or in a landscape, whereby the outside and the inside are intertwined in the way how you move through this uh, building. And the most important here is, again, this transparency in the way how light and landscape uh, of the architecture come all together. And, and in another example, in a recent project we just finished in Arnhem, it's a train station, or it's called the Transfer Hub. Uh, we similarly use this idea of uh, transparency. Instead of eight columns, or even more, maybe altogether, we needed 15 columns in this space, we melt them all into one twist, uh, carrying this, this huge roof. And with this, we, with this twist, we oriented and guided the people towards the way where they had to walk to. But you could see each other, as is so important in public spaces, that you know where you are. You can have many safety cameras everywhere, but they also need to see where things are. So, so the architecture guides you, orients you, and supports you in wayfinding. And, and this was for me very important to discover that when people walk around here, they walk in a curve and they can always look back where they can, come from. So it is not so that you again walk into uh, a dead end area where everything is linear uh, in the way how you move through space. But the most important is that we, on a small spot in the city of Arnhem, because that's where the station is, we could also introduce an enormous amount of flexible amount of uh, diverse programs so that the location would be very lively. Um, and they called it, you know, the clockwise planning so that you have in the morning and in the evening a set of programs whereby you activate the amount of people coming to the location. And with that, we could also, of course, stimulate uh, the public transport on this side. But the most important is that with that, that we could um, also make sure that if you are coming out of the station after 8 o'clock in the night, that you would feel safe, that people would see you, and that, that people would move around that side in order to go to the home or to the office or to the cinema, what is all to be found in this area. And the light would guide you again. Light was there in order to make sure to see where the entrances for the car park, the two bus stations, and then the bicycle parking were. And of course, a car park, again, without columns, with a lot of uh, artificial light. I mean, you know, these scary movies you don't like to watch when uh, you suddenly uh, feel something awkward going on in a car park. Um, this is what we didn't want to have in this uh, car park. We wanted to make a lobby, but it's so transparent and open but that you almost don't feel that it is a car park. And you know, with the future of uh, driving, I'm sure that this will become also an interesting parking a transfer location for the electric car because, because of its uh, flexibility. So let me finish with this uh, last project. It is an, uh, it's a house. It's one of my earlier houses. I designed it 20 years ago. It's called uh, the Möbius house. It's, it's a house whereby a client who's there still, who still lives there, um, who's so happy with the way how the program of living, working and sleeping is all introduced in one gesture in the way how you move around in the house, but almost in the landscape. So you walk with the landscape through all these different aspects of the house. And the outside and the inside of the house are all intertwined in one gesture. You live with this landscape. It's almost like if you are in the landscape when you are in this house. And this integral quality, this combination of the way how the landscape and the architecture come together here were for me very important to uh, bring into a balance whereby I didn't want to make an iconographic architecture as I explained in the beginning. 
I didn't want to work with the idea of an architecture that is actually pure image oriented. No, it is this quality between the balance of the way, like in the Katsura Palace, you have this nature, the calmness of the place, and the way how that moves with you, without any dead end again, uh, with you, as if you work and live in a life cycle of the everyday life clock of the week. And that's why I'd like to come back to this image, because the Katsura Palace balances this all out of what I explained. And I think for that reason, it's so important to make architecture supporting health on many levels. And it should be a place where you'd like to come back to, like with this uh, palace, because maybe I came back through it through all the projects I designed. And I think it's with a good book what you read, what you like to reread again. Um, this is where architecture should communicate with. Thank you very much.